I want to welcome everybody to Healthy Seminars. My name is Lauren Brown. I'm the founder of HealthySeminars.com. I'm also a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. My practice in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada is called AccuBalance. And as you know, because of isolation um, at Healthy Seminars, we've been running a series of, uh, of these lectures um, on all different topics. And our intention is, um, and was, we started this in March 24th, 2020, was community, unity, immunity. We wanted to create resources available to you to bring the community together. Hence, we got our cameras on. So we wanted you to kind of connect with each other. So even though we're doing physical distancing, um, it doesn't mean we have we we can still have social solidarity, and that's what we're doing here. So turning on our cameras and having a ta- having a chance to connect, and we wanted to fill your brains not with what's on the news and media, but fill yourself fill yourself with information that can serve you or serve your community. Um, and with it being um, in isolation, so many practitioners that are on this call, um, we've moved to telemedicine as telehealth. And so I had the opportunity to sit down and chat with, well, not literally sit down, figuratively, we were distancing over the phone with Benjamin. We were just chatting because he was going to be at the Integrated Fertility Symposium. Um, He had a booth all set up for Conceivable. And we were just talking about how fertility patients, this could be a blessing for them because they get a chance to rest. You know, like with the soil, it's nice to give the soil a a rest for a year. You don't grow it every year. And so rather than running into another IVF cycle, This is actually an opportunity for many women and men to uh, do that preconception care. And and he shares that he's been very busy because they have a whole herbal dispensary and their their practitioners are taking care of the fertility patients because although they can't do acupuncture, they can do herbal medicine with them and dietary advice, et cetera. And that's when it kind of dawned on me that, oh, Benjamin's a licensed acupuncturist. Ingrid is a medical doctor, and Kirsten Karchman was the founder of Conceivable. And this came about like, why don't we put a lecture together to share with practitioners um, what they can do to support women's health and fertility? And so I want to thank um, Benjamin and Ingrid, and particularly um, Five Flavor Herbs and Conceivable Proline and Kirsten for putting this lecture together for you guys today. And I'm just going to give you a a brief introduction of our speakers, and then they're gonna kind of tell you what they're gonna cover and what to expect during this time together. So Ingrid is a medical doctor, um, and she brings. she's also a co-founder of Five Flavor Herbs, and she brings with her a research background in anthropology, Latin American studies, botany, phytomedicine, um, when she lectures, and she lectures cross-cultures and treats using botanical medicine and herb-drug interaction. And she is what I call Dr. 3.0. She's truly an integrative doctor. She's a medical doctor, but practicing both um, the integrative approach. And so it's really great to have you here today, Ingrid. Um, Benjamin is a licensed acupuncturist, also the co-founder of Five Flavor Herbs. He regularly lectures at institutions and symposiums nationwide on herbal pharmacy um, on on the intersection of TCM and Western herbalism. So I'm looking forward to seeing how he's combining traditional herbal medicine with Western herbal medicine. And he, he talks on mental health, women's health and dietary therapy. And then Kirsten Karshper and I go way back. We're actually really good friends. We fellows of the ABORM colleagues. And um, I think of you more as a good friend, Kirsten, than, a, than just a colleague. And she was the founder of Conceivable. And she's gone on to be the founder and CEO of Brazen. And she's a a real leader in women's health revolution. And she's really committed to significantly improving the lives and clinical outcomes of women with PMS, menstrual cramps, PCOS, endometriosis, and fertility. So that's our, our group today that's going to present. I do want to share with you um, our disclaimer. So I just want to remind you guys um, that this is for educational purposes only. This is not medical advice and should not be received as such. If you have a health condition, please seek out Uh, medical support from a qualified healthcare provider, because this is for continued education purposes only. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this on to Benjamin. He's going to kind of lead the way. Benjamin, my whole team's here in the background, so we're here to support you if you have anything you need. You guys, you have questions, chat, put them in the chat room. And at the end of the presentation, you can raise your hand by hitting the participant or raise hand button at the bottom of your um, computer 
and that will digitally raise your hand and we can give you mic rights. And if you're posting in the chat room, um, the speakers may look at that as well and can answer that on the fly. So I'm looking forward to hearing this myself and Benjamin, please take it away. All right, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having us. Uh, we're really disappointed that we didn't go to come to the fertility symposium this weekend. And I was really looking forward to connecting with your community and spending time with Kirsten uh, and kind of relaunching conceivable there. Um, but we'll have to wait till another year and a different uh, microbial climate. Um, but I know that was not an easy decision for you to make. Uh, I think a lot of people are probably challenged by that, but we're glad to be here, glad to be representing and glad to be giving back to the community a bit. Um, as you mentioned, our dispensary, our herbal pharmacy is, is actively serving a lot of people. And so uh, we're recognizing that a lot of our colleagues are having to make a pivot to telehealth. And uh, there's a lot of people and organizations in our community that are providing support. And we have some unique positions to offer guidance and support pertinent to uh, fertility. Um, Ingrid is going to start off this webinar with some kind of medical position statements and resources that practitioners can utilize and access to have some authoritative guidance uh, on how to make recommendations uh, based on concerns that their uh, patients might have. Uh, we're going to do a little Q&A ourselves with Kirsten about uh, really utilizing kind of advanced basal body temperature and ask for some, some pearls uh, from her because we're going to discuss some of the, the barriers to effective telehealth practice and the opportunities that exist and, and what skill sets practitioners might want to dust off. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of my favorite Western herbs that I use to combine that, that I wouldn't treat women's health practice or men's health practice without. Uh, for optimizing uh, menstruation, fertility, vitality, uh, and how to incorporate those into uh, fertility practice. So uh, Ingrid, take it away. Sure. I'm going to just try to make sure I can advance these slides. Let's see? There we go. So I think one of the questions on people's mind right now is, you know, what are the safety factors around pursuing pregnancy right now? Um, should that be the primary focus or concern? Um, and so I wanted to um, bring to you some of the information that I have been able to gather from multiple sources um, related to answering some of these questions and also point to a very few research studies that are starting to get published to back up some of the rationale. Um, a little bit more about myself. Um, I am not a fertility specialist or an OBGYN. I'm an internal medicine doctor. I practice primary care. And prior to last month, I had very little experience practicing telemedicine. But right now, the clinic I work in, which is a community health center in a rural area of Northern California, um, where I serve mostly patients that are on Medi-Cal or Medicare, um, we have shifted almost exclusively to telemedicine. And uh, right now, almost all of my visits are happening by phone. So like many of you in the audience, I'm also getting used to a new um, format um, and adjusting to just that kind of practice and bumping up against what I'm able to do um, over the phone versus the things I really need to see people for. Um, and sorting through a lot of decision-making around all sorts of different health questions. So again, I don't necessarily um, handle pregnancy in my current practice, but I do work with a lot of women around many women's health issues um, and also a lot of pre-pregnancy counseling uh, around women who are uh, considering pursuing fertility treatments um, due to failed attempts in the past. Um, and so that's sort of the background that I'm coming from. So going to the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, um, they actually have come out with a pretty comprehensive set of guidelines. Uh, I'm not familiar with Canadian guidelines, um, but I presume it's probably very similar. 
is that in terms of what's happening in the fertility treatment world, um, there is really a halt on a lot of therapies um, that uh, individuals and couples would otherwise be pursuing to meet their fertility goals, mostly due to the trying to balance the risks and benefits of um, exposure to any kind of healthcare environment in this current moment. Um, as well as you know, preserving the healthcare workforce. So they're also not being exposed to people from the outside. So a lot of this is just based on um, basic principles of social distancing because most uh, fertility uh, treatments in terms of conventional practice really needs to be done in person. Many of them are very procedural. Um, so these are some of the guidelines that are being uh, proposed now, there are some more urgent issues, especially when, uh, say, somebody who is going to be undergoing chemotherapy or radiation might actually be recommended to just go ahead and, um, for example, do cryopreservation at that time. But in general, a lot of elective procedures in all sorts of realms, um, whether it's fertility or even the knee replacement surgery, these are all being um, put on hold because of coronavirus. Um, and many fertility practices are going to exclusively telemedicine. So um, the link to these guidelines and a lot more information is included below in the slide. Um, but I did want to start off with that. Um, ben, do you have some thoughts about how, what kind of opportunities this presents for acupuncturists and integrative fertility um, treatments, given that a lot of these conventional practices are likely to be on hold? Uh, well, that's the crux of our whole talk okay. today. Uh, are you done going through all the recommendations? No, I'll okay, go yeah, go, go ahead and go. <laughs> so, Kirsten, I'll probably want to get some of your feedback on on that opportunity as well. But I'll, I'll go through a few more of the safety considerations first, and then hand it over to the people with the expertise in that treatment realm. And um, one thing that's worth uh, introducing: what what is the foundation of your credibility for being able to talk about Chinese medicine and fertility? Ah, of course. Thanks, Ben. Um, uh, something I didn't say in my bio is that I am a Chinese medicine baby. Um, so that's a big part of where, um, I bring my, uh, subjective, uh, perspective into this picture. Um, because, um, my mother used Chinese medicine, uh, mostly herbs, um, starting in the mid 1970s in order to conceive. Um, and then I grew up in a household where herbs were always cooking for all of our various health problems. Um, and then when I was in my 20s and having a lot of problems with irregular periods, I get my period once or twice a year, had no idea when my cycle was going to happen. Um, I actually also went to using Chinese medicine at that time and was able to then have two successful, um, very normal, healthy pregnancies without a lot of interventions. So that's the other part. Besides my medical credentials, I have sort of the personal side of things and, and seeing uh, Chinese herbal medicine work uh, both for supporting all aspects of women's health, um, but also, you know, all the daily things as well. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'll go back to the doctor stuff. Um, so uh, a lot of, I think a lot of the decision-making about whether or not to actively pursue trying to get pregnant right now is a very, very, very individual choice. For some people, if they've been going through lots and lots of work already and they feel like they're already personally primed, this might be a really good time to make that personal choice, especially if you have more time at home, um, especially if you have more time at home as a couple, that could be a good time. Um, but I think it's also worth weighing what is the general healthcare landscape as you potentially embark on a great unknown. Um, pregnancy in and of itself is a uh, great unknown. And then parenting is even a whole other can of worms. Um, so I think that thinking about what type of healthcare resources are available in your area. If you live in an urban area or have access to great healthcare, you're probably in good shape, uh, especially because many healthcare systems um, are pivoting very robustly to telemedicine and already have those capacities. For example, the Kaiser Permanente system already had video visits available. They're rapidly able to transition over to using that technology. Um, and so that might be just fine for a lot of people. 
in a lot of rural areas um, or in urban underserved communities, that access may be really limited and make it a lot more difficult for people who are trying to have normal prenatal and, uh, and um, delivery care um, because the healthcare system is so burdened. So those are some considerations. Um, the interesting thing is, in terms of looking at the data right now, um, initially, um, there was a lot of fear that coronavirus itself or uh, acquiring COVID-19 during pregnancy would possibly be devastating for pregnant women and for their fetuses and for their babies. Um, right now, there is a very, very teeny amount of data coming out of China, but so far, there does not seem to be increased complications or mortality. Um, but it's tiny numbers and very, very small studies that are starting to come out. Um, and so uh, we can't say for certain, but it does seem to be a different situation than with influenza. Influenza has a long standing history of being very dangerous to pregnant women who develop uh, secondary pneumonia and a lot of complications. But I think that the jury is still out and it's going to require a lot more data gathering. Um, so I do have a link here to the Chen uh, study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine last week. And that is uh, data coming from a study of 168 women in China. Um, so very limited data set. That data set also shows that there was a much higher rate of C-section in women who presented to the hospital for delivery who were COVID positive. It's very hard to know what the cofactors, what are the confounding factors? Is it because that hospital already has a higher rate of C-section because of the perspective of their OBGYN? Or was it because they were trying to reduce uh, potential viral exposure to healthcare personnel and so decided to uh, force a delivery in a controlled environment? We won't know, and that data will probably have to come out of uh, U.S., Canada, Europe, um, and in a more diverse number of settings for that to really pan out. Um, but I do think that it's worth noting because many women um, who are pursuing natural fertility treatments are also looking forward to hopefully having a natural delivery as well um, or avoiding those complications that might lead to C-section. Um, I think the most reassuring thing that we have so far is a uh, a uh, small number of uh, data that are showing there doesn't look like there's vertical transmission of COVID during pregnancy through the placenta. There is, of course, a postpartum risk of uh, a infant acquiring COVID um, either in the healthcare setting or from family members who could be positive, um, but vertical transmission has not been documented. And in fact, uh, the study that's cited here from the Lancet is showing that there is transmission of antibodies from mom to baby. So the babies are born with antibodies to the virus. We have no idea if they're protective or not, but um, the virus itself does not pass through the placenta that we know of, nor has it been demonstrated to pass through breast milk. And the WHO has presented a very strong position statement along with lactation groups to promote early uh, skin to skin and early breastfeeding. And limit the amount of separation of babies from their mothers if there is a chance of COVID um, because they recognize that the benefit is greater to the baby. Ingrid, I want to comment on this slide and just some of the chat. So um, the reason this material for us is so important um, is because patients are going to need that reassurance, right? So when they start to explore trying to conceive naturally or with IVF, because in the States and Canada, the IVF clinics are coming back, uh, they're starting to come back early May. So they are slowly coming back in different states and in different provinces. Um, why is questionable? You know, some people say they're doing it because they can't handle their overhead. So they're coming back and they're under the guise of it's in the best interest of the patients. Um, but there are some patients that waiting probably isn't great. That doesn't mean they're going to jump on, you know, they still may choose to physical distance as much as possible. So they may not visit your acupuncture clinic. So one is this is where the herbal, being able to um, support them, the fertility, herbal, dietary, lifestyle supplements. So knowing um, what we can do for them and educating them. And so we're going to get into that. With this information where we find it important in our clinic is patients want answers to this. They're quite concerned. Should I be trying to get pregnant now? And they just have these worries. And if you're going to help give them with authority, as in you got data, when I say authority, you can just not just, I think, but here's what we know. 
and quote a few things, which Ingrid has just laid, is laid out for us, you can let them rest a bit that at least we don't know, but we know it's not been really bad news. And what we do know it actually seems okay. And that at least lets them rest a bit. Okay, I can try to conceive naturally. There are risks. Um, or I could do IVF. So I just wanted to touch on if anybody's glazing over because somebody's talking about research here. This is the first step that's going to let your patients relax because they feel that you understand, you get it, and it's safe for them or safer than that they thought. And now they're interested in, okay, so what can we do to optimize my fertility? I just think, because this slide's important, but I think a lot of people, because it's research, will be like, oh, I don't need to know that. Actually, this is your introduction discussion with your patients. It's going to be one of the most common questions you're going to get in telemedicine. Thank you very much for, for reiterating that. Um, I also wanted to say that um, this slide um, contains a number of links. I know it's just a lot of uh, URLs, but this will go out at the end of the webinar. We'll send these. These are hyperlinks. Um, these are all very, very uh, good resources, WHO, so not just US-based, but the WHO, CDC, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, um, the National Perinatal Organization, um, which has links to so much information. And because this is changing so rapidly, I linked to studies that were published last week online. Um, this is such a moving field that I would not take anything in the last slide as static. It could change next week. And so I would rely on these up-to-date web-based resources to look and see what are the clinical guidelines this week? What should I tell my patients this week? Not, oh, Dr. Bauer said this thing last month um, because that slide could become irrelevant. <laughs> um, but I would encourage you to look at some of those, those studies because they are, they're interesting and the abstracts are really easy to, uh, to get. Um, some of them are open access as well. And then um, we have a, just I'm gonna, some, some of the comments are so relevant. So if it's okay, in Grid. Uh, Sadna Singh, she's a fellow of the ABRM. She's uh, OBGYN and uh, uh, Chinese medicine practitioner. And she says she reassures them about no known negative effects and then leaving the decision to them about whether they use this time as preconception or actively start to try to conceive. So I just wanted to share that. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. I appreciate that feedback. Uh, so you know, we're going to explore some of these a bit, and that was a good lead-in to exploring some of the challenges for acupuncturists practicing remotely um, and some of the opportunities that are here. Uh, obviously, I, I know in your know, colleagues of mine in the Bay Area um, are saying that there, many of them are completely closed, their physical contact. Some of them are seeing people one day a week instead of five and only working uh, with people who are on therapeutic treatment plans for chronic pain um, the, you know, of, a, of a greater severity. Uh, but some of the challenges, you know, we can't be doing pulse, we can't be doing other palpation-based diagnostics. Uh, I do a lot of uh, abdominal palpation um, for internal medicine, and I can't do that with people now. Um, but you can ask people to palpate themselves on the abdomen and get elicit some feedback there in a way that you can't ask somebody to take their own pulse. Uh, we can't perform acupuncture or manual medicine, and we can't, um, there's a shift in spatial intimacy due to physical distancing that uh, there, there might be some compromise of the therapeutic relationship and aspects that our intuition might come into play or ways in which we might pick up on physical cues. Olfactory cues are definitely out the window. Um, Looking at, you know, so, so many people base their therapeutic treatment plans on a frequency of visits for insertion of acupuncture needles. And there's this uh, obvious compromise of uh, frequency of patient contact. Um, so we're, we're, for many of us, no longer able to practice acupuncture. Um, quickly, I'm also not an expert uh, like many of the people that come to uh, uh, come to healthy seminars or the International Fertility Symposium in fertility, um, but I've been practicing herbal medicine 25 years, and a lot of people that I have an active therapeutic relationship with uh, or seek me out for herbal medicine come because they you know come or say I want to work with you, um, and you know I practiced in Santa Cruz, which you know, California and 
East Bay and San Francisco, places where literally you can go out and uh, throw a rock to and hit the next acupuncturist um, from most vantage points in those cities, uh, places where people can go see traditional uh, fertility experts trained in China, um, you know, as well as people who've been practicing 40 or 50 years. So there's a lot of choices. Um, so when people come to me, I will be very forthcoming and say, uh, here's my expertise. And, or you can go see Leslie Oldershaw around the corner from me, who this is very much her expertise is in fertility support. Um, and a lot of times I'll do that. I'll refer out. Uh, but somebody says, well, I just want to do herbs with you. And I want to go acupuncture somewhere else. So uh, I've been using herbal medicine as my main modality. I almost always refer out for acupuncture at this point. Um, so I'm really inducing, um, encouraging, compelling my fellow practitioners to brush up and dust off uh, their, their herbal chops, so to speak, um, and bolster their confidence in what they were trained in. Uh, I, I see a lot of people get out of traditional Chinese medical school and have a lot of hesitation about prescribing, making recommendations, either because they've never seen it effectively modeled, never seen herbal medicine effectively modeled for people. Um, they went in with convictions that they just wanted to use needles as a main modality. Um, just want, want to compel people to you know, come back and recognize how how simple and effective prescribing can be for harmonization of the menstrual cycle and optimization of fertility. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pass this off to Kirsten in a minute because Kirsten holds the intersection of being a health tech entrepreneur and using high tech digital complexity to deliver uh, effective, simplified um, diagnostics and treatment. Uh, for fertility and menstrual regulation, um, while always championing, uh, we can break this down uh, into some some reliable variables that are going to support eighty percent of your clients. Uh, so um, that's the frame of reference I'm coming from, and uh, a couple other take home pieces that are important for practicing remotely. I think. Doing fertility prep is something most people that I work with or come to me say, I don't want to wait. I want to be pregnant my last menstrual cycle or six months ago. And, you know, my criteria is really if, uh, if you're under 35, you know, let's, let's work on this for a while with just herbs. Uh, and if you're over 35, I might refer out with a little more emphasis, somebody with greater emphasis and or refer out to a reproductive endocrinologist. Uh, as an initial step. Um, but this gives us a little more space to emphasize, take your time while people have hesitation about some of the guidelines and uncertainties that Ingrid just discussed. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good moment to give people honest feedback about being patient with optimizing their health, wellness, fertility prospects um, without being quite as goal oriented immediately. Uh, so, um, Kirsten, you know, in, in, you, you've developed some really advanced um, adaptive technologies, and I, I want us to circle back to a real simple adaptive technology um, that I know you've done a lot of educating around, which is basal body temperature. Uh, let people know where they can get resources if this is not already part of their uh, set of guiding tools for supporting their patients. So I, I, I will definitely talk about basal body temperature charting, um, but a couple of other things that I think are incredibly important to think about um, in terms of the challenges and opportunities that remember that like, this is a huge opportunity for a complete renaissance in the way that we think about how we care for our patients. And in, in our own internal selves, the way that we relate with this opportunity gets directly transmitted to our patients. And so I think it's really worthwhile really thinking about how we're framing what's happening with the pandemic and the social isolation and finding out like when everything breaks on the other side of that, there is, there is new life, right? I always like what my midwife said to me. She said, you know, every woman 
in transition will say, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And she says, if she can surrender to dying because she is dying, because the part of her who is not a mother yet is dying. And as she passes through that threshold of, of um, transition to delivering her baby, that part of her dies and a mother is born. And I think the same thing is happening for us right now. She always says, if you can't surrender, you will suffer in transition for a long time. And the more that you can take a deep breath in and say, I am dying and I release that, that you can move to the other side more quickly. And so I think the faster that we can do that as clinicians, the less suffering we will have and the more opportunity that we'll actually have to be of service to our community and to our, our customers and patients. And so if you live in the Bay Area, in my opinion, while you can't get acupuncture very easy, not having to travel to go and get your services could be actually a very positive spin for people. Like, oh, I can get my herbs um, and I get to visit with you, the person that I have this amazing relationship with digitally, but I don't have to travel. Um, there's an opportunity for some spin in which you can say, this is a great opportunity for us to be in better contact and, um, and for you to not have the stress of having to travel to our office. And so thinking about what are the opportunities for your, for your patients now that there's a new way of doing it. Like I had a neurology appointment the other day um, with my neurologist, which, you know, neurology is very hands-on digitally. And the truth is we didn't need the physical part. And so while certainly if you are heavily based in doing acupuncture, you're going to think like, I have to do that. I have to do that. But, you know, even when we built the, the conceivable software that we're using in the fertility space, the algorithm outperformed me. And so there, there, that is not to say that the experience wasn't better, but, and, 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 you know, it, it, that doesn't mean that it outperforms everybody else, but it does tell us that we can use really good diagnostic skills to get much better outcomes. And if we're practicing digitally, this might be an opportunity for us to really hone those skills. The second thing, back to what Ingrid was saying around the risks um, around getting pregnant um, during this period of time and exposure to COVID and the data are you know, coming in every single week, like Ingrid said, showing that the risks to the mother and both to the um, developing fetus and to the infant seem like pretty mitigated compared to what we might have expected compared to the flu. However, um, I think that I had COVID-19 mm -hmm. um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was sick for 15 days. I had pain in my body, like femur pain that literally I thought my bones were being crushed. Um, such high fevers. And so you know, some people are getting, you know, very little symptoms. Sometimes people are having mild symptoms. Some people are having very severe symptoms. I would say mine were probably middle of the road. I was tested, but not until after 13 days of being sick because just there weren't tests available in Austin at that time. Um, but I wouldn't recommend any woman to be pregnant in a time when it's possible that she could get that sick while she's pregnant. And so again, depending on your point of view about how you counsel your patients, um, despite like what the data are showing about the safety, it's also a good way to talk to patients about like, but still there is this risk that you could get very sick while you are pregnant. And is this really the right time to take that risk when maybe that risk could be significantly diminished in one or two or three months? And like Ben was saying, and maybe could we really just take the focus back on going internal and looking at like, what are all the areas across our whole life around our habits, around our environment, around our ecosystem that can be amped up and improved and harmonized so that in that time when there's less likely that we can contract COVID-19, that we're really like ready to step up to the plate to have an amazingly healthy pregnancy and, and subsequent live birth. So um, had to like give those two cents because I was like yeah. chomping at the bit, like, I want to talk, yeah. I want to talk. Um, and so around basal body temperatures, this could be a great tool to use in the absence of being able to take a patient's pulse if you're a good pulse diagnostician. Um, on the conceivable website, we do have some videos detailing our specific way of using basal body temperature charting. Um, remember, um, ours are slightly different than what you might read somewhere else. So there is, you know, you'll choose the one that makes sense for you, but there's a pretty um, neatly laid out basal body temperature diagnosing, diagnosing video. It's free for you to watch if you um, want to go to shop.conceivable.com. Um, for us, what happened was is we started understanding that um, not only could you use basal body temperature diagnostically, but also you can use it as a feedback loop. So if you're 
follicular phase temperatures are you know, above 97.8, that's Celsius if you're in the US. Um, we know that those are too high. We know that the association with that will mean that there'll be significantly less cervical discharge and that typically ovulation will occur too early. So if you're using an herbal formula to clear heat, then what's happening is, is you wanna know, well, how cold can I make it without injuring the young? And so you're giving, you're like, oh, I'm gonna make a hypothesis that I can give 60% of cool, which is our cold formula. And I'm gonna give 40% of a, a foundational formula that's appropriate for this person's constitution. The next month, you'll see the change. How much lower did the temperatures drop and was the young affected? And so it gives you this greater level of feedback that the patient can't tell you like, oh, that was too cold. Maybe the patient didn't even have loose stools as a result of it, but maybe the temperatures dropped too low that you'll almost never see that. But I'm just making up an example, you know, in the, in the space of that. Um, conversely, maybe you gave 60 percent of a cooling formula and the temperatures didn't drop. And you're like, hmm, that's a really cold formula. What's missing, maybe it's actually not yin deficiency that we're dealing with that's causing the heat, but actually blood deficiency. And maybe the treatment is not so much clear heat, but tonify the spleen and make blood. And when there's more blood, there'll be less heat. And so if you start using the basal body temperatures as the feedback, making your hypotheses across the bleeding phase, the follicular phase and the luteal phase, and then in the subsequent month, using the basal body temperatures to check how was my hypothesis and what happened? Because it will give you information that much earlier than, than the ability to say like, oh, did the symptoms change and by how much? Um, I think that that's where the biggest value is around basal body temperature charting. And nearly every new acupuncturist that we work with almost always will tell us, well, I don't wanna use BBTs because the patients don't like it and they find it to be too stressful. And I will say, like I've said a thousand times, it's complete hogwash. Um, they will tell you that they feel stress from it, but it's our job to then craft the story around the opportunity for the patient so that they see it as something that's really valuable. And if you do that, they won't see it as stressful. So I always tell the patients, don't worry about diagnosing your BBT. We spent 20 years coming up with a way to diagnose it. You just take your temperatures and bring it. And then I'm gonna give you feedback on what's happening and not what's happening. And then the most critical thing that you wanna do when that happens is no matter what that BBT looks like, from one month to the next month, you find any pieces of it they're improving. What our patients need more than anything, what they need desperately is hope, right? Because it's just such a slog. It seems like, you know, at some point after three months, the symptoms aren't changing so much. Their cycles aren't changing. You've kind of fixed like 70% of everything that was really obvious that was going on. And sometimes the basal body temperatures can actually give them feedback like, oh, shit is still changing. I'm still getting better and I still feel hope that I can do this. And so use that opportunity when you look at the BBT, especially like I used to do it old school, one month on one piece of paper at a time, which I still actually prefer, because then you could lay out three months at a time on the table and say, look, in January, here's all the things that were wrong. But then in February, this changed and the temperatures came up and the temperatures came up and it's less sawtooth. And then the next month, this got a little bit worse, but these things all got better. And every time you'll see the patient going, Oh, they just, they start trusting you more and more that you know what's going to happen, right? Because you're going to tell them, we're going to give you this formula. Hopefully it's going to make these temperatures drop. And when that does, the patient says, oh, I believe in you. I believe that you can help me. And they need that just as much of the herbs that we're giving them or the acupuncture or the counseling that we're giving or the nutritional therapy. Because, you know, uh, Lauren and I are big uh, Joe Dispenza fans. And if you haven't read his book, I think it's the most powerful thing that every fertility patient should read because it really talks about the power um, of how our thoughts dictate um, what we say in Chinese medicine, where the mind goes, the chi follows. So, um, so helping our patients to reframe the whole experience of struggling to get pregnant is a really powerful tool that we can use remotely also. With that, I'll stop. All right. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, there's some questions coming in that we're going to have some time for Q&A, correct, Lauren? And maybe we yeah. can go back to those questions. Yeah. Do you want to get to some of the material and then save yeah. that? Because some of them are on text stuff, and I thought that would be good at the end so you can get into some of the herbal mm -hmm. and how you treat. Yeah. Um, I think, well, uh, yeah, one, one of these things that we, we borrowed a diagram from the conceivable website uh, about keeping it simple, you know, a reiteration that we want to balance 
and harmonize yin yang chi and blood, uh, supplement yin yang chi and blood, uh, and balance and regulate blood and chi uh, when they're stagnant and understand how those correspond to um, signs and symptoms, how those correspond to, as Kirsten just outlined, uh, basal body temperature. Uh, I really recommend uh, setting a foundation, optimizing fertility during quarantine. I like to, uh, I, I think that so often men are left out of this conversation. Uh, and I, I see that as a pattern uh, in families. And you know, many times women have been working on their fertility for months. And I say, well, has your husband or your partner been tested yet? And it's very common that the answer is no. Uh, that they have no metrics for their semen or sperm quality. And uh, another pattern I, I see is their unwillingness to talk about it or participate in the process, um, which winds up pathologizing the woman. So um, this may be a good moment. If I, I see a lot of men taking this moment to be proactive in their health uh, and say, I'm not working. What can I do to care for myself? What can I do to... Uh, improve myself in this, this moment where I have some more free time or can use the transitions where I was commuting to, for self-care. Um, you know, so, so looking at how to uh, foment men's health, we're going to talk about maca next, but, um, and we're also going to talk about intimacy and libido. So, you know, one of the things that we specialize in is integrating Western herbs and traditional Chinese herbs. This was part of my original training, um, came up uh, tutored and mentored by Michael Tierra and Christopher Hobbs and uh, Thomas Avery Guerin, all of which have written books on this topic. Um, some of my later teachers um, suggest, you know, Zhang Zhang Jing would be rolling in his grave if he thought we were modifying Shang Han and Jing Wei Yala traditional classical formulas uh, with anything um, at all, but it's, it's all I've ever known. So I have some useful tools as a result. Um, maca root is a uh, herb that grows in the Andes and is a root related to radishes and turnips in the cruciferae family uh, that's, that's widely available. And um, one of the barriers people may be experiencing is not having access to traditional Chinese herbs. Uh, yeah, and, and not having access to affordable libido tonics. This isn't just a libido tonic. I mean, it really nourishes uh, the yin and the blood, has indications for menopause in addition to um, being somewhat of a jing and yang tonic, uh, aphrodisiac. Uh, so this is something that you can uh, recommend that your patients buy online. I mean, that, that's, despite us having a, herbal pharmacy dispensary, I often encourage people to buy things online that we might stock and or that might make things more accessible to them, either because they present to me that they have cost issues uh, or geographical barriers, uh, need something sooner than we can deliver it to them. So uh, this is something that you can go to most health food stores and find in powder. Uh, it's often in the superfood section and it's often relatively affordable. Uh, you can take a one to three teaspoons of powder daily. And this is something that works as a rejuvenant, as a vitality builder. And another way that I like to recommend herbs is recommend things that people can feel right away. A lot of our supplementing herbs, um, people don't recognize the influence that it's exerting on their body in an efficient way. Um, so I like to recommend things that are going to be palpable for people and then give them coaching on how to experience that. Uh, I think some of our chi regulating formulas are things that you can easily coach people on. Here's how you take it. And within an hour or two, you're going to notice you're having a different somatic experience in your body. With our supplementing formulas, that's not always the case. Uh, so offering people recommendations for things that are going to give them a subjective experience of vitality. And in the case of uh, this, many people really quickly experience uh, enhanced libido quickly, men and women. Um, so we'll, we might blend this with formulas uh, 
in a tincture form or have people take it separately in a different delivery system. Uh, it's generally recognized as safe to consume as food. There's some speculative risks based on it being a cruciferous vegetable that I'm not going to deep dive into right now. Um, is the next slide some of the... So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, I would say somebody's asking, is this warm or cool? I would say it's neutral. Um, it's it's vital. It, it has that uh, paradoxical effect. It, um, I might consider that it's like iguanjan, uh, which I didn't put on this list. Uh, iguanjan supplements the yin and the yang uh, while clearing deficiency heat. I think this has that capacity to supplement yin and yang while clearing deficiency heat. There's quite a bit of research on uh, application of different strains of maca in, or Lepidium myri is the Latin name, in uh, reducing menopausal hot flashes. Uh, there's quite a few animals. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the uh, studies in female fertility are in mice. Um, and so there's, there's not as much that can be extrapolated, but there is demonstration of increased litter volume um, and, you know, you, you can go in and find citations for that and understand how people have extrapolated what the mechanism of action is. But it does not exert an estrogenic influence, you know, so the, it's, we're left to speculate as to why it might do that. Um, the Chinese herb I just mentioned is the formula Yi Guan Zhan, Y I G U A N J A N. Benjamin, I have a question related to this because you're hearing maca in formulas. Because I'm I'm new, to, I know about conceivable. I'm new to the five flavor herbs. Yeah. You guys carry the maca with these formulas, or do you do you make these for us? Just because people are going to want to know if you're going to combine it, how do we uh, get that? And is that something your company does? Yeah, we operate an herbal dispensary. Practitioners can sign up for an online account, and uh, we keep this as a tincture. Uh, we don't dispense it as a powder um, along with granulated Chinese herbs, but we do keep, keep this as a tincture. And if you wanted to, you know, if you have a good handle on um, the conceivable formulas, those are all in our dispensary software. You can go in and plug those in. You'll get a confirmation. Your patient pays for it. And, uh, you know, you can dose with that. Um, I, I hope that's not alarming to you, Kirsten, that somebody might. Um, modify that system. Um, no, I mean, yeah. I think that, you know, people will find like, that's, I, I love innovation, right? So yeah. how do we take something um, and that's already really impactful and continue to iterate on it in a, in a powerful way without complicating? I think that's the most important thing that you want to, that you hopefully that we preserve from conceivable is the simplicity, because I think it's the simplicity that allows people to feel confident about their ability to make a really solid diagnosis and predict the outcome and then measure whether they get it or not. So I think the more complicated that they make you make formulas, the harder it is to identify what is a piece of this that actually made the difference or made things worse or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so you know, here, here's a set of other formulas that an, another indication for maca is the research suggests that it both increases uh, sperm motility and increases uh, semen quality. And uh, it also has indications for reducing BPH in men. So you can use it in uh, damp heat draining formulas and blood moving formulas for the therapeutic goal of reducing prostatic swelling, uh, which may impact the quality of sperm as well. Uh, or you can use it in supplementing formulas um, to raise the vitality uh, with the goal of, um, you know, increasing libido, raising the young, raising the chi. Uh, somebody asked, how long is this webinar? And it's about another 10 minutes plus a half hour of question and answer. Uh, So I'm, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, these are my my basics that I see so many people supplement their chi and blood uh, with food. And 
you know, where, where and how to bring in more protein, more fat uh, is, are, are more often than not the, the variables that I see missing in people's diets, uh, especially women who are trying to conceive um, uh, and also regular meal times. And I often endorse to people before you spend a hundred or two hundred dollars a month on herbs, or six, you know, you can spend six hundred dollars a month on acupuncture with me. But if you're not eating, you're not going to get that much traction with it. Is is something I often throw out in the in the first visit. Um, so that's that's a piece. Uh, we're going to move on here. To another herb, um, a really important concept in herbal medicine is the, the concept that something is amphoteric, uh, something that induces our body's own homeostatic self-regulatory mechanisms. Um, chase tree is an herb that does that. Hawthorne is another herb that does that. Um, this is so profound, it's related to manjingza, the Chinese herb. Um, and has been used for centuries in uh, used for centuries in regulating the menses, either for prolonged absence of menses uh, or for scenarios in which uh, women are having challenging PMS, uh, maybe uh, multiple sessions of bleeding or prolonged bleeding. So um, it's very useful in. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ingrid just spelled amphoteric for everybody. Uh, uh, very useful for regulating hormones, regardless of the presentation. So one interpretation, this is from the, an interpretation by my colleague and dear friend Thomas Avery Guerin and his using Western herbs in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, uh, this courses the liver and rectifies qi for liver depression affecting Chang and Mai channels with indications of menstrual pain, menstrual block, premenstrual swelling of the breast, irregularities, ovulatory pain, and premenstrual concerns. Uh, moves qi, frees depression, and opens network vessels for decrease in lactation due to liver distension, uh, depression with distension and fullness of the breast. This is to be used in the luteal phase in this way. Um, other practitioners that we work with, myself included, uh, also use this herb in the follicular phase in concert with supplementing herbs, much like Kirsten has laid out in the conceivable system. You know, you're looking at what needs to be supplemented in the follicular phase. Um, you may be supplementing or regulating blood during menses, uh, and then you're doing more chi and blood regulation during the luteal phase. And this depiction right here of these functions uh, depicts uh, pairing this in concert possibly with a bupleurum or chai hu formula, um, shayosan or sinesan or their various derivatives. Uh, I do that very regularly. I also pair this again in the follicular phase um, with something like wenjing tang. You know, I might use wenjing tang or I might use um, bajan sam, some, something of that nature for supplementation. Um, in concert with this and really strongly feels like it strengthens the treatment. Um, I've also used this independently of Chinese herbs and also see it work very well. But I think that when you use this independently of Chinese herbs, it doesn't create the staying power of the therapeutic treatment plan. It doesn't change the system in the same way. Uh, another popular use of this is for supporting women and transitioning off of birth control pills, uh, scenarios in which they might experience uh, acute menstrual dysregulation. Uh, so there's some dosing guidelines here using three to nine grams in decoction, but most people I know use this in a tincture, two to four milliliters. Some people will dose two mil in the morning only. Um, do you have anything you want to add about Vitex, Ingrid? Um, Vitex is something that I do often recommend in the context, not because again, I'm not really doing the fertility uh, treatments necessarily, but with irregular menses, especially post-hormonal birth control, mm -hmm. especially with either DEPA or OCPs, mm -hmm. um, we'll have people when they're having a hard time getting their cycles back. 
um, uh, it's a, I use it in a sort of, uh, I wouldn't say grotesque, but in a very simplistic, uh, I'm a doctor in an office without a, my own herbal dispensary. And I have to make simple recommendations that people can wrap their head around and go buy at the health food store. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's one of the things that I definitely use frequently and used, um, myself quite significantly. Um, but again, if there's underlying deficiencies, it doesn't address um, address that, and you need to use the foods and the herbs together. Um, we're going to skip straight to the questions about mixing Vitex with some of these formulas. Um, uh, there is a slide that people will get on some of the Western constituents and understanding a mechanism of the constituents in Vitex, but I think we want to talk about combining with the formulas more. Yeah. Um. Manjingza, you know, many people are saying, but Manjingza is not used in uh, fertility treatment. That, that's accurate. And I think, I think it's useful to separate these and just say they're, they're different herbs, even though they're in the same genus. They're both Vitex genus. Uh, Manjingza is Vitex nagundo. It's Vitex agnus castus. Um, and just separate their traditions of use, bring this into bring Vitex agnus castus or chase tree berry into this tradition um, and save that for its traditional application. Uh, my experience mixing this with fertility formulas, as I mentioned for supplementation, you know, using Wenjing Tang, uh, Gui Pi Tang, both of which have indications for deficiencies of qi, blood, yang, fluids, um, where there's bleeding outside of the normal menstrual cycle. Um, you know, Wen Jing Tang, these are indications that are in uh, Jing Wei Yala. Uh, so uh, when, when I see that, when they're due to deficiency and deficiency with cold and fluid depletion, uh, you know, that, that's very much a follicular phase go-to for me. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Kirsten, that's what uh, Conceivable's Warm is based on, mm -hmm. is Wen Jing Tang. Yep. Um, oh, no, Warm is based on Jing Wei Shen Shi Wan. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, so we, we use uh, Wenjing Tang. That, that's what I use more. Um, but we'll also use uh, Ba Wei Di Huan Wan or Jing Wei Shan Shi Wan combined with Vitex. And, you know, I might dose two mil of Vitex along with that two mil, um, two or three mil of one of these liquid extracts of a traditional Chinese formula. Again, I'm using constitutional diagnosis, so I'm just giving examples. Uh, and, and for me, I'm using pulse more than I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trained in basal body temperature. You know, so I'm, I'm using pulse and I'm using sign and symptom diagnosis. Uh, I'm also, for women who experience, uh, you know, usually women who experience liver cheese stagnation, giving herbs and asking them to check in and track how early in their cycle they experience that. It, it's often somebody, something that somebody can really get some biofeedback, uh, subjective feedback on the degree to which it's alleviating their constraint and tension and other somatic experiences during that premenstrual phase. So, uh, Like know. crying when their husband tells them to unplug their phone or eating three chocolate bars and breaking out or... <laughs> Any yeah. of the other things that I'm guilty of. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, Kirsten. Yeah, Kirsten, do you have anything else to say about, about that? I mean, I think it's an interesting topic because I'm talking about Western herbs. I'm interested, Kirsten, um, and we're, you know, we're running out of time for more lecture, but I'm interested in, are there supplements that you recommend to women who are trying to conceive? Uh, that's one of the questions I have for you, because that's really combining something from outside of the tradition for supplementation or regulating of the body systems, because there's either an evidence base for it or there's some subjective experience. Are you testing for uh, any micronutrients? And what are your favorite go-tos for libido support for women and men? So I think there's multiple questions there that are great questions. Um, the first thing is that, um, you know, people always ask me, oh, what are the best supplements for fertility? And I always say none, um, because the only way to improve somebody's fertility is to understand specifically 
with a high degree of clarity exactly why that person is not getting pregnant Mm -hmm. and then prescribing for that phase of the menstrual cycle. Because in each phase, there are so many different things that are happening. So you have this window to be able to address. So I love maca also, especially for the women who have um, yin deficient heat, who have advanced maternal age, who have dryness, scanty cervical discharge. I like, um, but I would only use it. I like the feminescence, the maca feminescence brand, mm-hmm. just because that's what I have experience with. Um, and I know that there's many strains of maca. Um, that it's incredibly effective for cervical discharge. Um, So if they are having really scanty cervical discharge, um, they'll report quite a profound change in that, um, which is really useful. We know that that's impacting the yin. Um, But I wouldn't use it in a woman with ever, with a woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome, Mm -hmm. because already she's too yin deficient. I mean, excuse me, too yang deficient. Like her temperatures are below 97 typically. So giving something that is heat clearing and yin tonifying will typically make those conditions worse. They'll have more bloating and fatigue and dampness. Um, And same thing if they're having like super low temperatures in the luteal phase, even in the absence of polycystic ovarian syndrome. So um, so the two, I only use two supplements. I'm not using any micro testing. I am more inclined to use food. Um, again, by looking at like, well, what's the problem as opposed to like, oh, these are the good foods that are fertility for It's like, well, if, it depends if the person has polycystic ovarian syndrome, then I'm going to use something that's going to be much more like a super low carb diet that with a lot of yang tonic foods, mm-hmm. warming foods, invigorating foods, versus if this woman is 39 years old and her FSH is too high and she's got scanty cervical discharge, we're going to be giving her much more, you know, vegetarian diet with lots more yin producing fluids. Um, so the only two supplements that I use, and I always am looking like, how do we simplify? I always think that less is more. So the maca feminescence, and then um, I really love um, uh, Floridex iron, hmm. uh-huh. the liquid version, because it is so flipping absorbable. I've seen people's hematocrit double in one month from that when they had historically been on pharmaceutical grade um, iron supplements. But what I started doing towards the end of when I was still seeing patients is I was combining um, two quarts of bone broth, beef or bison bone broth with Floridex. And uh-huh. you will see blood production like you've never seen it in your life before with uh-huh. that combination. Like it's it's miraculous. Like hair's growing like crazy. Skin looks beautiful. Cervical discharge is nice. Um, but but only in the patients that are having scanty menses, like less than four days of bleeding, soaking a tampon or a pad every four hours with no clotting and no cramping. So um, it's important that you get rid of the clotting before you actually identify, is this the right amount of menstrual blood or not? Because when there's clotting, there'll be hemorrhagic bleeding, get rid of the clotting. And then suddenly you see a lot of scanty bleeding. So you've sort of peeled back that layer of the onion um, around clotting is actually causing pathological bleeding. There actually isn't a normal amount of blood here. Mm-hmm. So Ben, you had a couple questions. So um, what supplements do I like? Those are the only two that I ever used. Um, I, I would consider bone broth food therapy. I don't like collagen personally because um, because if you have any autoimmune condition, it tends to trigger autoimmune behavior. Um, so um, and because so many of our patients do have some whether diagnosed or undiagnosed autoimmune looking profile, um, I avoid collagen. Although I, in theory, it makes good sense. The, you know, the other question was, what is what are your favorite herbs for? libido and i think you just answered one because i imagine that that's part of why you're using maca but are there any other modifiers or i don't use any herbs for libido like i always want to diagnose why does the person have what they have and so Mm -hmm. if someone has low libido the the clinical presentation is one either there's a problem in their relationship if the husband is not respectful to the wife she will have no libido and no herbs will fix that Um, nothing you do and so mm -hmm. you look crappy if you're using herbs to fix libido when she doesn't believe that her husband has respect for her or mate um, or partner if they're in a same-sex relationship and so that's the first thing the next thing is is she too tired right is it from chi deficiency is it because now sex has become one of the to-do lists that she can't get through already in which she needs to manage her to-do list and she needs chi tonics and or is it because she has yang deficiency right And so if you give maca to someone who has yang deficiency, you will make the libido problems worse. And last but not least, is it because she has chi stagnation? Because I don't know anybody out there who's ever had really bad PMS, you don't really feel that horny. 
Although a good orgasm would probably make sense. Um, but you probably can't get there because you feel too like, ah, I kill everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so personally, I don't like any herbs for, for libido because mm -hmm. I don't, that's just not my orientation is to use a herb or a formula for a symptom mm -hmm. when often there's a, there's something in the ecosystem that's producing that symptom that actually, if you, most of the time, like if, if they say I have low libido and you find out that her husband, like they have some marital problem. Often, if you help them get the resources to fix that marital problem, they get pregnant because that was the thing that was keeping them from getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. I, I can't agree more, Kirsten. And I think that um, some of the, the time right now, I think that going back to the sort of shelter in place situation that a lot of people find themselves in, um, it can both be, you think, oh, great, we have all this time at home together. When people be, you know, there's lots of jokes out there about how many babies are going to be born in about nine months. But I also think about the type of tension that builds. If you have other kids in the home, you might not have time because you're with them all the time. So when can you sneak away for, you know, parent lovey-dovey time? Oh, that's going to be hard. Is it after they're asleep and you're just too tired so you don't? want to do it on you all day you know like right. it's like mama 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 what are we gonna do now what are we gonna do now your mate's like hey baby what are we gonna do now hey baby and you're like oh just everybody get away from me i think that if there's a lot of babies born it will have been just from the first week when people when it was sort of a honeymoon <laughs> we're not we don't have to go to work we're in our pajamas all day now people are wearing this i mean all of my friends are like i've had the same outfit on for three days i haven't washed my hair you know that's not really conducive to sexy time either um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna um, I want to bring this to like a big picture and then uh, bring it down <laughs> to what we've been chatting about. So, we started off with okay, we have there are men and women that want to have babies, and you talked about the risk of having babies now. There is um, so much that couples can do um, during this time to maximize their egg and sperm quality in uterine environment. Um, Kirsten emphasized there's uh, based on how many nutrients, etc. Uh, Kirsten's emphasizing you still go to the principles of Chinese medicine. What's the underlying cause? That's the principle. Find out what's going on because when you treat the imbalance, the body has this innate ability to heal and take care of itself. And that's part of the preconception care. And then you've been talking about mixing some of the Western and, and Chinese formulas. I understand um, Benjamin Ingrid at Five Flavor Herbs, you guys can do that. And then there's the conceivable line, I'm understanding, that has pre made like uh, tinctures that has been based on Kirsten's 20 plus years of practice in her computer algorithm to treat women, to help them with ovulation and resolving underlying imbalances that are leading to subfertility. Um, and so the main point I want to see if I'm hearing it is these patients that are stressing out saying, I can't get pregnant now because I'm in isolation. We're saying, actually, there are so many things you can do to maximize your fertility. And as acupuncturists, you can get on a telecall and you can do dietary therapy, that's valuable. You can do lifestyle, sleep, exercise, rest. You can do stress reduction. You can even teach them acupressure points. And then another branch of our medicine is herbal medicine. And so if you're an herbalist and you like to play and customize, I think five flavor herbs can do that. You're gonna let me know if that's correct or not. That's and correct. if you're not uh, a master herbalist, but you can use herbs and you wanna help the patients, then you can work with the line that Conceivable has, which has a practitioner's experience with computer algorithm, algorithms, based on Chinese medicine diagnosis, you can start to use these right off the shelf for your patients. Is that what I'm hearing? I wanna just, cause I wanna tie this thing cause I know there's lots of questions. That, I think that's accurate. You know, one of the things that I wanna clarify is that um, what one of the barriers to dispensing is now is not a time in which as many people are investing in comprehensive dispensaries for their own clinics that their clinic is closed. Um, and so um, we're seeing some of the people, we, we actually manage operations for conceivable now. So we're, we're seeing people are not investing in, you know, the whole roster of, you know, 10 formulas to stock because they're not seeing people, but they're coming the same practitioners who are part of the conceivable family uh, who are really seasoned veterans who've been using this for six or seven years uh, are coming to our dispensary to have them compounded on their behalf. Even if they're just using one of those formulas, we can put it in a two ounce bottle and send that out. Well, so that's great. So you guys are able to 
right now, if you're not seeing patients, you can do you, the practitioner. So you guys listening, you can do a, 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 a teleconsult with your patient and then you can prescribe a formula. The patient pays you and then you contact by flavors and they can ship the formula directly to the patient. Correct. We also have the ability for um, patients to pay us directly if you're a practitioner who doesn't want to deal with that aspect of it. So it can go either way. Um, and um, we are we are still shipping out conceivable um, uh, practitioner kits and larger volumes directly to practitioners who do have their own dispensary so that we can continue serving their practices. I mean, and I just want to re reiterate just from a business perspective, this is an unprecedented time to be a leader for your patients and to really show up for them. Like just how Lauren is doing um, for all of us in the acupuncture community, um, really like it's not very hard to set up these Zoom calls. Every single one of you knows at least five really unbelievably interesting people that you could interview to give value and information to your, your, your patients and really encourage them to use this. This is a, an opportunity when there's a lot more time to cook, there's a lot more time to meditate to, you know, like I'd be, if I was still in practice, I'd be like creating like three month programs where I was meeting with that patient once a week, prescribing herbs for them, consulting with them, helping them manage the stress, um, and, and so that you're really showing up as a, as a real value add. And so that in this time of extreme stress um, and fear, everybody's really afraid about what's going to happen. You're the person who's like, I'm here to help you, to be your leader. And you can lean on me right now when times are hard. And that will build patient loyalty that we, you've never had an opportunity to build before, which is great because you, you get to serve and they get what they need too. One uh, resource that, because Zoom is not HIPAA compliant, um, and unless you have an EMR that has its own specialized system within it, there is um, uh, there are a number of free telehealth uh, platforms out there that people can sign up for and use and adopt pretty quickly. Doxy.me is one, um, and that is HIPAA compliant, and it's actually free. I own no stock in it. My clinic just set it up for us. Um, so as long as your patient has a stable internet connection and an email, you can set that up, and it is it comes HIPAA compliant. So if you don't already have some fancy EMR, um, you're not part of a bigger system, and you're worried about taking on any more overhead right now, um, your, your clinic is in your... Uh, home office or, um, you know, living room, uh, you can do those visits in that context. And I'll, I'll share that we have a resource on healthy. We have a couple of free resources and then some of their CE approved for telehealth. So just the whole idea of what to do for telehealth. So awesome. there's a couple of questions about how do you get your patient? So one is, do you have something of value to offer them? So yes, herbal medicine, dietary life, uh, dietary and lifestyle therapy, and even nutraceutical recommendations. So you definitely have value for that. And then to reach out to your patients, um, you're not taking your clinic and just posting it online. It, it is a whole different animal. Um, and when we go back, when we go back, it's not going to be the same as it was. I don't believe that. Um, and a lot of people may have hybrid clinics. Um, may, you may be required to, it may make sense that all your initials are, um, are done via telehealth so you can make sure they're the right fit and you're not bringing them into your space unnecessarily during this time that we're in if we go back to work but we don't know so how do you get patients well you it's a process you reach out to them so no i, I can tell you not too many people are um are like you know they were seeing 50 people a week and now they're seeing uh, 40 people a week on telehealth it, it's a it's a still a slow process why People were in shock at the beginning, so nobody was interested in your telehealth. It was all Netflix and Zoom parties. Um, and now people are starting to want to get back to their life. And so now they're like bored of Netflix and they're, they want to get back on the fertility um, process. However, they don't understand the telehealth. You're a needle, so how do you help me? So you have to educate them. So you're going to have to create blogs. You're going to have to change your homepage. Like our homepage on AccuBalance has changed. Our Facebook page has changed. It's all about telehealth. Um, we've been putting out free videos for our patients. Um, and so, and then you email them and let them know you're going to call them. So there's been a, somebody did a talk that I listened to and the best, it's a very low conversion to telehealth on email, but if you call the patient, it's very high um, conversion. 
So somebody has figured this out for you. So I just want to let you know, somebody said I'm emailing them, they're not responding. Well, somebody's actually done some work around that. And yes, it has been shown to be very, very low conversion through an email. Um, so an email followed up by a call. So email, check in, how are you doing? I want to know how you are. Not about come in, like, how would you feel as a patient? You're stressed out, you have fertility issues, you're financially under stress, and your practitioner calls you and says, yeah, why don't you schedule telehealth with me? I would think you want me to schedule the telehealth because you're hurting for money, not because you have my best interests at heart. So why don't you just check in on your patients and see how they're doing, right? That's the first step. Um, and then see if they respond. Um, and there's just all different things that you're going to do. I will share with you. It's not like then you got telehealth. It is like starting a new business again. Um, so you could sit here sitting on your hands and hoping you're going to go back to your practice um, in a week or months. Um, or you can be where most successful people, when time of crisis happens, the people that survive it and thrive are the people that adapt. They, they pivot and adapt to the situation. The people that wait it out and say it's going to be like it was, they're the ones that don't usually survive and they definitely don't thrive afterwards. So that's not my strategy. So the telehealth part, you're going to have to invest some time and energy. And we have some free resources on healthy seminars under telehealth. And everybody's teaching telehealth now. So go on YouTube. You'll find lots of things, I'm sure. And just be prepared. It is a process. And so just take your time and start to educate your patients. Know that you have value and communicate that value to your patients. Um, most people were resistant in my clinic and some of the people that we've had on our webinars, because we've, we've had a series of telehealth webinars or telehealth related like this one. And People have learned different things, you know. The first web, the first couple of telehealths I did, I went way over time, like crazy over time. I couldn't believe it. So, but you learn. So I just want to share that you can do this. You have value. And some of the people that started it, because it's the whole process of starting, they're loving it and it's growing, growing rapidly. So you just got to start. And then what are your tools? So for me as an acupuncturist, I can't put needles in them, but I'm a herbalist too. So to me, it's it's so easy to follow up with a patient and say, yes, I can still help regulate your cycle. How? We're going to do it through diet, nutraceuticals, and, and Chinese herbal medicine. Chinese medicine, actually. And mindset. In What's that? And mindset. Mindset, is, that's my favorite thing. I'm the mindset guy in my clinic. That's patients that see me in AccuBalance. It has to be about mindset. Um, so, yes, there's so many tools we have. Um, they, people call it meditation. They call it um, um, the mindset you can call it Qigong, right? So I just wanna, there's so much that you have to offer. And then um, again, thanking Benjamin, Ingrid and Kirsten for sponsoring this talk. Um, there's some resources. So Conceivable has resources for you. Um, they've had ready-made formulas that have been used in a clinic over 20 years. And many practitioners have been using this since the inception of Conceivable in their practice. And I know Kirsten has got data on how, light, how symptoms change. Body temperature change, PMS goes away, menstrual pain. She's written a whole book on this. What's the name of your book? Seeing Red. Seeing Red. So she's written a whole book on this. And so she knows through diet and herbal alone, without touching her patients, that people have benefited. And now Five Flavor Herbs are running Conceivable. So you have that company, Conceivable, you can access through Five Flavor. There's, And you also have Five Flavors that can... Um, make make you um, custom made formulas as well as patent made and if you want to do the mixture you got the opportunity to mix some of the blends that they're familiar with and i'll ask because maybe you don't do this but as a practitioner if, if you like the idea of the macas or the vitex but it's not your 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 super strength you're really good with herbal can they consult with you as a practitioner saying i have this patient this is what i want to do is there anything else that can amplify the formula because you're seem to be an expert benjamin in mixing Chinese with Western herbs? It's not, that's not quite live yet. Um, ben and I have been working on revamping our remote clinical practice uh, as everybody else is. And so um, in addition to doing telemedicine with our own um, patients, we will be offering <clears throat> some consultation services, um, but that's not up yet. Um, that's through Paonia Integrative Medicine. Dot com. Um, that's a work in progress. Uh, so stay tuned, but we'll definitely be letting folks know about more services in the future. Yeah, but, but yes, I'm on the computer uh, a lot of the time and frequently people reach out. It, it's helpful if we have a relationship with people and not just 
the five flavors dispensary, but if, if I know who they are, and if, if it comes out of left field and somebody asks a clinical question, uh, it, it might get lost in the shuffle. But if somebody says, I attended this webinar with healthy seminars and had a good experience and having this patient that's experiencing this and here's how I'm thinking about it, uh, it's, it's very easy to offer guidance and make recommendations. So I, I have that, recommend, that relationship with a lot of our customers. And can we do, um, are you up for some Q&A now? Or do you have, is there more you want to present? Because it'd be nice to have. Yeah, no. yeah absolutely. A few more minutes, sure. So if anybody wants to ask a question, please raise your hand. And then I'll just look in the chat room if you can see if there's anything um, there that, that you want to answer. Some of them were quite general, like, um, and I apologize, but like more, what is your experience with omega-3 for fertility and autoimmune patients? I find that a general question. I don't, I, I, I'm looking for guys a little bit more specific. Um, mm -hmm. There's so much data and research out there that you can find, unless you guys have answers for that. But I, I'm looking for some um, some specific uh, questions. So if you can, um, if you're going to raise your hand or ask a question, if you have something that um, you want clarification, that would be really great. But with time left, a, a very broad general question may not get uh, much of an answer. Some of the questions I saw are a lead into a three-hour lecture. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, one question that uh, Dr. Singh asked it was, uh, what is the application of, um, what's, what's the difference between using uh, Vitex in conjunction with balancing the system? I, it's, uh, I see people using the language in a lot of these that says with fertility formulas. And I don't really think about fertility formulas. I think about using constitutional diagnosis from a traditional Chinese medical perspective. Um, and and using good Chinese medicine to support balancing the menstrual cycle. So um, what is the difference? I observe that the Vitex amplifies and accelerates the rate at which the cycle is regulated. Um, and I especially see it benefit the uh, luteal phase, uh, the premenstrual phase, and ex amplifies the... Uh, relief of premenstrual experience. Some, uh, some individuals, some women do experience uh, reduced libido as a result of taking Vitex. So that is an important thing to observe and dialogue with your patients about. Uh, if, if it is reducing their libido while regulating their cycle, uh, it may or may not be functional for their uh, relationship dynamic and fertility goals, frankly. Um, one person asked, do we ship to Canada? The answer is we currently don't have a worth, worth the effort method to ship to Canada. So I want to thank um, Kirsten, Benjamin, and Ingrid for this talk. I thank you for sponsoring this talk as well. And thank you guys for coming in. Check out healthyseminars.com forward slash resources for all the upcoming lectures, and then go to healthycenters.com forward slash conceivable for the replay of this. And you wanted information on conceivable and five flavors, those links are there as well. And what we'll do probably guys is we're gonna post it on the healthycenters.com forward slash resources. I know not all of you are subscribed to our email or goes to the trash. So the replay of this will go on healthycenters.com forward slash conceivable. And uh, we'll put up a link or find a way for you to get um, those handouts, okay? Thanks, Lauren. All Thanks, right. Ingrid. Thanks, Thanks, Dan. Nice to see everybody. Bye.